please stand with us and sing to the top of your heart this tonight. We are low in number, but we can be high in enthusiasm. Are you ready? for prayer. Let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight. We thank you again for this chance to be in your house tonight. Lord, thank you for each one that's come. And we pray now that uh, as we meet together again, that your name will be exalted, glorified above everything else. Lord, we're thankful today that as we celebrate this Christmas season, the time when our Savior came mm. to redeem our souls. Lord, what a what a, what a humbling thought it is that the God of all creation would come to die for me. As we say that, each one of us, that he'd die for us. Lord, we thank you tonight. We praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, a couple things. We'll do another song. Got, got some announcements. You got one out there? You got yeah, it ready. Okay. Got it ready. You can be seated. Mike asked me to do that. I'm going to give a couple announcements, and that's it. You can sing, bring the ushers, and be good to go. Yeah. Uh, Tuesday night, 5 o'clock, uh, our candlelight service. Looking forward to that, 5 till 6. I encourage you to be here uh, before you head out for the evening or whatever you have plans on doing. Um, be here. And then the rest of the bulletin, the rest of the messages are all in the bulletin. Read it. Amen. I like that. I like that. A um, couple things before we turn to hymn number 136. Uh, first thing is, I don't know if you realized it or not, but every person that was here in the congregation this morning was part of a cantata. Yeah. Because pastor was reading the scriptures, and then at the, cor at the correct, precise time when it mentioned the manger, you guys sang a congregational song about the manger. Right. And then we were talking about Bethlehem. You guys sing a song about Bethlehem. That's how a cantata is made. So we started a new tradition. I think it might be good to keep going next time. But um, also another announcement would be that the adults, young adult Sunday school class is going to be uh, starting, starting again in the new year. We're going to have a, an, a, a, an outing at, at my house on the Friday, the 10th of January. Friday the 10th of January. It's not in the bulletin, so that's why I'm mentioning it. it, it I'm going to ask 
the bulletin maker to put it in the bulletin next week. But Friday, the 10th of January, at 7 o'clock at my house, 7 until 10-ish, uh, or until everybody wants to go home. Uh, but we're going to have some games and some food and some fun and more details to follow. You should probably send that person a text. Text? Okay. I think that'd be a good idea. Awesome. <laughs> Very good. So, but please turn to him number 136. Please stand if you're able. And we'll sing the first, second, and the sixth verse. We'll sing three verses. Now, ushers, please come on the th third verse that we sing, which is the sixth verse. The first Noel the angels did say was to certain poor shepherds in fields where they lay, in fields where they lay, keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so deep. No As you can come on this last verse, we're going to sing verse number six. Then let us all with one accord sing praises to our heavenly Lord that hath made him and earth of naught and with his blood. Seated, Mr. Mellinger, can you please ask the blessing on the offering? Our dear Holy Father, again, we just want to thank you so much for allowing us to come to your house, Lord, and to hear your word tonight. Lord, just uh, open our hearts, please, Lord, and have Pastor bring us the message that you put on his heart. As we take up these offerings, we pray that we use them in a way that is pleasing and honoring unto you. We just thank you for the safe travel for everyone to come out tonight. And watch over us, please. Let's pray. Amen.
Amen. Thank you there. Thank you so much. All right. I believe uh, you've got something. Have you guys been able to hand those out yet? Oh, oh you're going to hand them out now? Okay. They're going to give you something here. And I uh, put together just a little uh, synopsis of the tribulation period. And we'll kind of take a look at this. We uh, see where we're at tonight as we move along into the sixth and then into the seventh trumpet in the book of Revelation. And I hope you've enjoyed this study. It's a lot putting it together. But understand something. The, the whole idea of the tribulation, the, the, the this seven-year period of time is not as difficult, I think, as we try to make it sometimes. So uh, everybody have a copy of those? Anybody not have a copy, raise your hand. If you don't have one, over on this side, over here. Uh, over here. Over here. Over on this side, you got a couple over there. One, two, one, two, three, one, two, three. There you go. Okay, if you open this up, uh, it says tribulation first half. And we've got a number of things in there. Of course, the, uh, the rapture occurs before the actual beginning of the tribulation time. We don't know the time frame in between the rapture and the beginning, but it's a very short period of time. But there's some things that go on in heaven during that time. Obviously, the rapture is gone, and uh, the people of God are gone, and now starts that. So uh, judgment will begin, so you can work through. I've, I've given you the seven seals, uh, what we think they, they might occur as you look through this. Some other notes on there. Uh, we've already gone through this one, so turn on over to the next page, the other half, which is the second half. And let's look at what we've done so far up to this point. We have seen at the midpoint of the tribulation. Now, it's hard to be, uh, uh, does it happen at uh, three years and four months or three years and seven months? I mean, uh, we pretty much know some of this because the number of days uh, that are counted out by Daniel. So we see here as we walk through, we see as the second half begins that the Antichrist destroys mystery Babylon, the uh, uh, the, the false religion that's there, the, the false prophet re betrays the world church, and uh, uh, they begin to uh, destroy that. And we'll see that later in Revelation 17. We'll see it in uh, uh, as we go through uh, Revelation 17 and 18. Uh, then... As we've moved along here, as we go, we've seen the, the desecration, the abomination in the temple, uh, where a statue has been placed now of the Antichrist by the false prophet in the temple. And shortly after this, as you move first uh, through into year four, about three quarters of the way through, you see the first trumpet sound. We said, looked at the first trumpet. I believe these are highlighted for you. The first trumpet, the second trumpet, the third trumpet all occur within that first, uh, we'll call it year four of the tribulation. When we get to year five, we see the fourth trumpet and the fifth trumpet um, being blown. And we saw the, that last week. If you haven't seen these, go back, uh, uh, listen, and you can catch up on these things. But the fourth and fifth trumpet, we're now into year Six, and uh, as we go through, we saw the, uh, uh, the the beginning, the three woes, and the seven trumpets that happened through here, and so we have looked at the uh, the sixth trumpet right now. You can see where we're at. We're getting ready for the seventh trumpet, which will then unveil the bold judgments or the vile judgments that will happen towards the end. As we move through the end of this, during this last, uh, uh, really, year, because it's seven years, and even less than a year, we're going to see everything just poured out by the Lord. I want to, I'm glad I'm not going to be here. Amen. I'm so glad. I, I read this, and some people say, well, you know, it doesn't matter what, what, what goes on then, because we're not here anyway. But it does matter, maybe, is it'll break our heart to start telling others about the Jesus of Bethlehem, uh, the Jesus of Calvary, the Jesus that will, can stop them from ending up going to these places. So I uh, encourage you tonight, listen, as we go through this tonight, we'll start here uh, as this, 
We finished up last week in chapter 9 and verse 11. So if you want to open up your Bibles to there, uh, we will pick this up from there and keep going. Father, we come before you tonight. We are thankful, Lord, that you have promised to remove us prior to your judgment being poured out. And Lord, we're thankful tonight that uh, you've saved our eternal souls. But Lord, we also think tonight there are family members, there are friends, there are people we work with that maybe we've spoken somewhat to, maybe they've even heard the plan of salvation. But Lord, we haven't prayed for them like we should. We haven't continued to be persistent in witnessing to them like we should. If the rapture came today, they would go through. Except the days be shortened. They'd go through this whole time. Lord, help us tonight. Help us tonight to have a heart for the lost. Lord, may we not have an inverted testimony, but may we realize that our call is one of invading this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, permeating every aspect of life that we come across with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us tonight, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Chapter 9, verse 11. And they had a king over there, which is speaking of the locusts, of course, that we spoke of, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, Abaddon which, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. The name Apollyon simply means destroyer. And power is given to him. This is, this is Satan's uh, hellish version of Michael the archangel. He's come to declare war. It's an interesting time because uh, basically what's happening is, is, is God is allowing the unsaved people and, and these, these angels and demons and things to, to basically destroy themselves. God's people, I mean, for the most part are gone. There's some being saved during this time, but, but now he's just going to let evil destroy evil. That's what evil does, by the way. Evil destroys itself. Can't tell you how many times I've, I've watched people who've been on uh, down West Park in, in Cleveland and uh, places here in, in Michigan where they've been drunk and, and they've, they've thrown away their lives. Maybe it's drugs. Who knows what it is? But you know something? Evil destroys evil. And that's what we'll see as we, we begin to, to walk through this here, the sixth trumpet sounds, the second hellish invasion. Go ahead and look, verse 12. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. Now, some of you have studied this, you, and, and, and you know these things, but I think it's good for us to look back. When God calls something a woe, folks, that's something to be afraid of. I mean, his words for the Pharisees, woe unto them. I, I think of his words towards pastors in the book of uh, Jeremiah, which is woe unto the pastors that will not visit their flock. The woes that are there. And he says the first woe is done. And we've, we've seen the utter destruction caused by this woe. Now the sixth angel comes and he, he blows his trumpet. And the sixth angel in verse 13 of chapter 9 sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Let's take a look at this. The sixth angel blew the trumpet. A command is given, the Bible says here, from the, the horns of the altar, that golden altar that, that, that speaks of prayer. That's when it spoke of if you the tabernacle here on earth was that golden altar where people went, the, the high priest or the priest would come and off, offer sacrifices. The angel here is speaking from the same place where the angel and the trumpet blew in, in Revelation chapter 8 and verse 3. The sixth angel not only blows the trumpet, but is also given a command to loose the four angels, look at this, 
in, in chapter 9, to loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. He receives the orders from a voice. Let's look at that voice, that, that, that voice that's there. The angel receives it. Listen, folks, the voice that speaks is the voice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He has now given us the, uh, the seven seals and, the, and the, now we move to the sixth trumpet as we go through. We see the, uh, all that's going on during this time, the, the wrath that's been poured out. And now, in chapter 9, verses 13 through 14 and 15a, I, we see these four satanic angels. The source of the invasion, look in verse 14, is the Euphrates River. The invasion, if you look at verse 15, and the, the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to sway the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horse were 200,000, thousand, and I heard the number of them. We know this, that this, this, this time frame is going to last 13 months. 13 months of utter punishment. One and a half years of horrific judgment of all mankind. The question is, why would God use the Euphrates? Other rivers around, why don't you use the Jordan? Why don't you use other rivers that were there? I think he used the Euphrates for a river, or as a, for a reason. First of all, the river begins in the Armenian mountains. It's some of the highest mountains on earth. And when they're flooded in the springtime, the melting snows come down through the, the Taurus Valley, right out in, into the, the Mediterranean. Down through the Mesopotamia, I should say down through, not the Mediterranean, but the Mesopotamia Valley and down through there. Think of the Euphrates. Think of the things that happened in history at the Euphrates River. We believe it was at the Euphrates where the, right there where the Garden of Eden was. Coleman Young said it was Detroit. I don't think he's right, okay? Uh, I believe this is probably where it was. Think of this spot. This spot was the place where where God made perfection. Everything was good. He made man and woman. He said it was very good. And then man sinned. The first place of sin is where God is going to pour out his judgment right here. We had the great flood in Noah's day happening at this same spot. Later would come the Tower of Babel. All these evil things happening right here around the great Euphrates River. By the way, it's the Euphrates River that divides the east from the west. This river had great importance in God's plan. And now we see these, these four angels that rise up. They have in their hands the power of awful destruction, satanic evil. Go back, look at your text again. They're prepared for an hour, it says. They're prepared for a day, a month, and a year. The exact second and the, on the moment in God's calendar, these creatures are going to be released. I'll say this. Whoever these four chained angels were, they had to be enormously destructive. Whoever they are, they've been, they've been chained. Who knows how long they've been chained. Quite possibly ever since the fall of man, the rebellion in heaven, thrown down to earth. And these heinous angels now were bound in the Euphrates River. And a specific time will come and they'll be let loose. I want you to look at this next slide. I don't know if you can see it very well, but in, in 2016, it was estimated around 7.3 billion people in the world. Take a walk through some of this. One third of all humanity will be killed from this particular invasion. Now put some numbers together. I like numbers. 
You may not like numbers. I like numbers. One-fourth of humanity had already been killed, right, at the fourth seal. So we know that. Let's say 1.5 to 1.8 people, are, billion people are raptured. I don't know if that's accurate, not accurate. I, I saw numbers and how many people claim to be born again Christians. I'll just take that number throughout the ages. Maybe it's 1.8 billion. We'll, we'll, we'll run with that number. That would leave 5.5 billion people on earth at the beginning at the start of the tribulation period. If 25% are killed during the fourth seal, somewhere around 1.3 billion people. Can you imagine? I mean, the job to have, I guess, if you're, if you're going out, would be that of an undertaker because you'll have funerals more than you'll ever know what to do with. But think of this, 1.3 billion people die. That would be somewhere around four and a quarter billion people still on the earth. And now along comes this one, and it kills another one-third. Another 1.3 billion people. The world's population has gone from 7.3 billion down to 2.7 billion. Well, I tell you what, that's a lot of blood shed over this, over this earth. But judgment must come. God must bring forth the judgment, and indeed he will. The vials of, of wrath. In Revela Isaiah 13, 12, uh, in Revelation 16, it speaks, there's a verse down here, that people are rarer than fine gold. Take 7.3 billion people, now reduce that by two-thirds. You won't see a lot of people. Take a look at what's going to happen here as we go through this. 200 million attackers. I don't think they'll be as pretty as these soldiers right here, but that's the best picture I could find. Go down and look at your text again. Verse 16, the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, thousand, and I heard the number of them. And I saw the horses in the vision. Now, stop for a second. Understand that John must describe what's going on for the day and age they had. And for now. Will these be actual horses? I don't know. Could be. But if you would have said back in the first century that they are going to be fighter jets with laser missiles, would anybody have even understood that? No. No. So some of this, he, he paints a picture of what he sees. Now, I, I can't wait to get to heaven. I, I'd love to sit down with John the Baptist. I'll probably be 1.42 billion person in line, okay? But wouldn't it be great to say, John, what did you see? Then you know what happened, and, 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 and how would you describe that today? I mean, John didn't have an easy job. Plus, John was over 80. Right, Boyd? That's right. You know, we get older, we don't comprehend some things. And here's this, this old man, John, sitting on the Isle of Patmos, and, and he's got he's to relay this stuff and basically, God wrote the Bible. We know that. But he's got to bring this forth. And God's got to give it to John in a way that John can bring it forth to us. 200 million. By the way, and I, I may have spoken to this. I don't remember last week. There is one army in the world that has 200 million soldiers. Right. Where would they have come from back in the time of John the Baptist? No, nobody had 200 million. Nobody had 200 million 20 years ago. But today, China has an army, and they brag about it, of 200 million soldiers. I'm going to tell you, God knows what he's doing, folks. 200 million soldiers. And understand this, China isn't the friendliest nation to most people. You know, if they ever called in American debt, we'd be in trouble. 
No, I give our I give our president a lot of credit. Now, you may like him or not like him. I, I don't particularly like his morals too much, but I'm gonna tell you something. It took a lot of guts to go up against China. Right? right? And, uh, and do some things. And by the way, the, the end result is going to be positive for, for everyone here in America uh, in years to come. Maybe not today, but in years to come. And we, we have to think that way. But he went up against this powerhouse economically, militarily. Didn't even blink an eye. That takes some guts to do that, doesn't it? And he did it. I, I get tired of people. You know, people put down everybody and they put him down. I want to tell you something. That took some guts. And I'm glad he did it. Now, let's go through this text here. Verse 18. By these... Uh, go back up. Verse 17. And thus I saw the, the horses in the vision. And them that sat on them having breastplates of fire. And of jacinth and, and, and brimstone. And the heads of horses were as the heads of uh, lions. And out of their mouths issued fire and, and smoke. And brimstone. I want to tell you something. Back in the 60s, we would have thought you we were smoking the wacky tobacco. Right? I mean, what a description he had to give. Well, they, were, they were like lions, but, but, but they were like horses. And, and out of them came fire and, and, and brimstone. He's, he's trying to describe these things. Come back. I wasn't done with you yet. For their power is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents, and their heads with them they, they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Right. Just lay it out. One third of the remaining population is killed. I, I have this up here just kind of as a, uh, as a, a reaction here to the, to the, the wicked, to the plagues that's, that's there. Listen, verse 20 and 21. You ever play the game or maybe you wrestle with somebody and they, they said, you know, call uncle. Anybody ever do that? Yeah, I don't know if you can do that anymore. You have to be gender neutral. But anyway, you know, you get down, they hold you down. Uncle, uncle, uncle. And they let you go, right? These people have just seen five billion people killed upon the earth. They've seen the vegetation wiped out. They've seen the rivers turn to blood. The, the, the good earth, uh, the seas turn to blood and, and, and ruined. And there's no drinking water. And the, 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 the vegetation and forestation have been destroyed. Yet they still will not repent. Right. And that ought to be an encouragement to you when you've got brothers or sisters or loved ones that will not repent. They haven't been through this. And they won't repent. Those have gone through this, and they still won't repent. There's a time when a man or a woman hardens their heart towards the Lord, and they're done. That's right. They're done. We look at Pharaoh. You know, Pharaoh hardened his heart towards God. And then the Bible says that God hardened his heart towards Pharaoh. Some people think they can get saved whenever they decide to get saved. Right. But you're not going to. You're going to get saved when the Holy Spirit is convicting in your heart. And if there is no conviction, there'll be no salvation. There'll be no need to turn from what you're doing. You think you're going to be fine. You may even cry out and say, oh, Lord, save me. You're done. You're done. You don't get saved on your timetable. You get saved on God's. And I don't know when that point is when God will give up on an individual and harden their heart. But I believe you can look around our world today and there are people that fit that description very well. And God has just hardened their hearts. He'll use them for uh, whatever he needs to get done. But these, they, they would not repent. They continued to worship demons and idols. They just continued and continued and continued. They engaged in murder. 
A lot of that going on today, isn't there? I wonder how many children were killed today, ripped out of their mother's womb. I like this in Kentucky, you know. I, one reason I voted for this current president is I want to change the Supreme Court. You, you can't change abortion legislatively because the Supreme Court somehow has risen to the point they're above the legislation, legislators, and, and that's not supposed to be, folks. I, I wish you'd come next door and listen to this a little bit, and some of you have. That, that's not the way the Supreme Court's supposed to operate. They don't establish the law of the land, but they did when it came to abortion. They established the law. But I like this law in Kentucky now, and the, the Supreme Court upheld it. A woman going in to have, to, to thinking about killing her child, must now see a ultrasound of that child in her womb, and must also hear the sounds of that child in her womb. Praise God, the, 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 the liars and the deceivers that say that's nothing more but a ball of, of flesh will be proven wrong. And I pray that that mom, before she is deceived into killing her child, will take a look and will see that that's a real life inside of me. That's a real, it's a heartbeat inside of me. There's noise down there. It'll change everything. These people would not change. They would not turn anything over. I spoke of a man who wrote in 1906, you know, he talked about, by the way, not only that part, let me move on, their sorcery, their, their, their fornications, their thefts, their, their immorality. Doesn't it just seem to be multiplying all around us? People caving in on every side. I'm going to tell you, young people, you need to be strong. You need to get in this book. You need to stay in this book. You need to learn this book. Because the fiery darts of the devil are going to come stronger and stronger and stronger. The devil is going to do everything he can do. He may not be able to get your soul because you're saved. But I want to tell you this. He'll try to destroy your life. He'll try and destroy your testimony. There's some folks that they used to come to church here. I'm going to tell you, their testimony is dirt. How do you win somebody to Christ? How do you win somebody to Christ when you're out committing fornication and adultery and, and, and sorcery and doing drugs and all those kind of things? How are you going to do that? You're not. That's right. You're not. Why? Because they're going to look at you and say, well, I don't do the immoral things that you do. So if you're saved, I must surely be saved. Am I right? I mean, there's a, there's a way, and I'm, I'm going to preach in January on holiness. We, the Bible talks about us, be holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. Amen. We need to live holy lives. And it's going to get worse. And, and we've had some new babies now into the world. I want to tell you something. Some of our young people are 16, 17, 18 now. You ain't seen nothing yet. Wait till those kids are 16, 17, and 18. Wait till things keep toppling down and toppling down. I'm praying this. I'm praying the Lord will come back before those kids turn one. Amen. We get out of this place. Turn over to Luke chapter 16 for a minute. I hope some folks are watching tonight that maybe are unsaved. I, I, I love this, this event. This is a, a, a real historical event that Jesus speaks of, not a parable. How do we know that? Because he uses real names. But look at Luke chapter 16, verse 19. We're going to come back to Revelation. Just hang on. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple, and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at the gate full of sores. Now, let me stop for a second. The point of this message is not how much one man had and how much the other man didn't have when it comes to material things. Watch. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs, verse 21, which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. 
If you never focus on this verse, just stop for a little bit. Stop rushing through your Bible. But do you notice what happened? The redeemed person, we understand this person was saved. Angels came and carried him to Abraham's bosom. If you've ever been in a room when somebody passed away and they were saved, angels came into that room while you were there and carried that person off. Now, he's got a story about the other guy who died too. Here's what he says about the unsaved. And the rich man also died and was buried. Not very pretty there, is it? Yeah? Kind of good riddance. Okay? Uh, you're gone. Uh, I'll see you in Revelation chapter 20 at the great white throne judgment. The other one's up in heaven with the Lord. The verse says in verse 23, In hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus. That, that, you know, he wants the poor man now, doesn't he? Probably want nothing to do with him when he was around. But, but, but now he, he, he wants Lazarus. Likewise, Lazarus, he says uh, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. I, I preached on this before. Understand something. There's a gulf of fix between the two, and the people on one side can see the people on the other side, and the people on that side can see them over here. How do I know that? Because they're talking to each other on both sides of the gulf, aren't they? Right. By the way, that, that one side of the gulf is empty now. Right. Those folks are up in heaven. Aren't you? There is no more paradise, speaking of this area anymore. Uh, Jesus emptied that. He took him to heaven. That's where we're going to go when we die. We're not coming down there. And he says, uh, he says Ab but, but Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us which would come from thence. And then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. I want to tell you, every person who's died and gone to hell wishes that a Christian would go see the rest of their family right. and tell them the truth. If you want to do it for God's sake, do it for the dead's sake. Go tell their families. I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they come also into, the, into this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if, if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Hmm. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Right. We come to the end of, 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 of chapter 11 here, the sixth trumpet. And we see the fact that uh, there are still those who will not believe, who will not trust. Now, something interesting happens. In Revelation chapter 10, in verse 11, we get a divine intermission. This happened between the 6th and 7th seal. It happened between the 6th and 7th trumpet. It'll happen between the 6th and 7th vial or, or bowl. It's like a time where... <laughs> I just picture John sitting here on the Isle of Patmos writing all this stuff down. And God saying, okay, John, take a breath. Now we're going to go back a little bit and fill in some of the spots that we need to fill in that have happened during this time for him as well. And that's what he's going to do. So we come to chapter 10, and uh, we, we see again, we see this, this, this breaking as we go through, and it takes place. Now let's see what happens. We see something called the little book and the seven thunders. Revelation chapter 10. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was laid upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open. And he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth. And he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. 
And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunderings uttered, and write them now. Now, anybody want to understand what's going on? Let's find out. Who's the angel? And by the way, I'll tell you this tonight, that Bible scholars are divided down the middle on this. Don't build yourself a doctrine on who this angel is. Got that? There are major doctrines, there are minor doctrines. This is a minor thing from the standpoint of our faith. Do we understand that? Okay? So I'm going to tell you who I think it is as I go through. Is it an angel? Is it Christ? Good arguments. There's good arguments on both sides. This could be a great angel or it could be Christ. There are some things in scriptures look at that are not fully revealed to us. And sometimes when people say, I, I need an answer on this and I'll believe, you say, you know something? I don't have the answer on that one, but if you're waiting for that answer, then you're, you're barking up the wrong tree when it comes to being saved. If you need to know who Apollon is or, or this angel is, by the way, they don't know that much anyway to even ask the question, right? So we get the arguments that are there, but uh, very godly men have gone both sides on this. We're going to look at it and understand in the, in the Old Testament, Christ did appear as an angel, didn't he? He appeared as a, what was called an angel of the Lord numerous times prior to taking on a human body as he, we celebrate this week when it comes to Christmas and then was later crucified. But nowhere in the New Testament do we find Christ appear as an angel. On the Damascus Road, he appeared to a man named Saul, later Paul. Did he appear as an angel? No. He appeared as himself, as Christ, not as an angel. We never see it happen after he's already taken on the human body and now he's received his glorified body in heaven. That's what Paul saw was the, the glorified body of Christ. That, that's why and the, the, the bright light that was there and he fell to his face and he was, he was blinded by the light that was there. The book of Revelation, listen, we've already read through this. We saw Christ exalted and glorified on his throne, didn't we? He was exalted. He was, he was glorified. He was the one that was opening up uh, the seals. He's the one that's judging a, a, a Christ-rejecting earth. The word that's used, go back to chapter 10. And I saw another mighty angel. It's the same description that's given back in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 2 when it was very clear that it was not Christ. So who do I think it is? I believe it's a very great angel. It's not Christ. If we, if we look here and we'll, we'll look at some things, he, he comes down out of heaven from the presence of Christ the one who is in the midst of the throne. Christ is in heaven. He's upon his throne bringing forth these judgments. So he came down from heaven clothed with a cloud. Jesus didn't clothe with a cloud. He'll come in his second coming on a cloud, right? We keep looking here and he, uh, his face, his head, and all those things that were there. But he has in his hand this little book. So who is this? I believe it's a great angel. You say, oh, I believe it's Christ. Well, go for it. You could be wrong. Anyway, if you think it is, that's fine. I think it's a great angel. The point is this. What we miss is what is this little book? You see, we, we see this about the angel. We see he's clothed with the cloud. 
We see a, a, a rainbow upon his head. The angel's clothing is, a, is an envoy to Christ. He's the one ushering in, doing everything that Christ calls him to do. So he, he dresses in the right apparel. The, the clouds of glory are associated with the second coming of Christ. So he appears in, dressed in this cloud. It's coming in glory, but Christ is coming in glory at the second coming, isn't he? The angels announced his first coming. They'll announce his second coming. We see this man as he comes and his, his face as his son tells us of his identification. Remember Moses? Remember Moses when he was there meeting with the Lord and he, his face shone with the brightness that was there? I, I even think of John and Peter when they, they went to, uh, they were arrested for preaching the gospel. Remember they, the people looked at them and said that they looked as if they had been with Jesus. There was something different about them. I think Christians ought to have a different look. Don't you? Amen. There ought to be something about us that people want to know. Right? What do you have? What, what do you have that I don't have? You know, that's why I think I, think I, I dress... I dress fairly conservatively, I would, I would think you would say. I, when I mow my grass, I don't wear a t-shirt and shorts. I wear dockers and a golf shirt. Okay? You never know who you're going to see. All right? I tend to be a very conservative person because I don't want anybody to judge anything and think the wrong way. Amen. Right? So, I mean, that's just how I am. That's how I, I, I wear a suit and tie. I, I laugh nowadays. I, I see the things on Facebook and the postings and... And I see these preachers, and, and they got holes in their boot, but holes in their blue jeans, and, and, and dirty T-shirts, and needed ironing, and, and whatnot, and, and they're standing up there. And I'm thinking, do you have any respect for God at all? Right. right? Do you have any respect for yourself? I mean, I don't look that bad mowing the grass, okay? But you're preaching. But here's the funny part: as much as they don't make clothes an issue, they make clothes an issue, right. don't they? They make clothes an issue more than we make clothes an issue, right? I wear a tie. You can preach, wear a tie. You come to church. You don't have to wear a tie to come to church, right? I don't come out there and say, hey, you're up to tie. You need to go home. Get out of here. I don't, I don't tell the ladies what to wear. It ought to be modest, right? But they make an issue out of it. They make a huge issue. And the thing is, they all look the same. Yeah, right. It's just like they went to Men's Warehouse and said, I need a $100 pair of holy jeans and a $50 shirt that looks like it's been in the washing machine six times and needs pressing. Am I right? right? And then give me some tennis shoes to wear too. And somehow, you know, and I'm getting a little off tangent here. That's okay. I, I, I'm old. I can do that. Listen. We need to walk and talk and live and give everything to Christ. The things that we wear, the places we go, the things that we do, all these things. We're representatives of, of God here on earth. We're, we're representing his kingdom, right? Look like a bum. Here's, here's the problem. And what I was going to say is they, they, they think they have to do this to identify with the people that are sitting out there, but some of those people look better than they do, and they, they, they want to identify. I don't find anywhere in Scripture where the priest was called to identify by acting like the people. Am I right? They had special garments they wore, and, and there was something there. Why? Because... You know, in, in God's hierarchy of authority, that, that, that you're supposed to come to the pastor. You, you come to the priest. You, you come to the rabbi. You come to them for spiritual guidance and things. Look, at when I'm having trouble, I don't want to go to somebody that's going through the same trouble I'm going through. His face is as a sun. His feet is the pillars of fire. And we, we see this picture. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop here tonight. I'm going to get the little book next week. But you see this angel standing on the sea and on the land. What's going to happen here? And we'll get into this little book. And I'll, I'm not going to tell you what it is. But I'll tell you next week. So you got to come. I'll tell you next week. But it has something to do 
with how this angel was standing upon the sea and upon the land. And I'll just tell you this, that God's taking it all back. God's taking it all back, and I'll leave it right there. I'll leave it right there. When you come next week, these last uh, year, year and few months that might be there, the devil's going to be gone, folks. Gone. Millennial reign of Christ will come. Let's stand, heads bowed, eyes closed. Maybe tonight you want to come and pray. I stop there. Sometimes you have to stop soon enough to give you a hunger to come back for some more, right? A little book next week. Father, we come before you tonight. Maybe there's some here that just need to come and pray. Maybe, maybe they need to come and pray for a loved one. Maybe they have a loved one that's unsaved tonight. And Lord, they just want to come and pray for that person. But even more than that, they want to pray for the strength and the words to be able to witness to that individual in a loving way, but in a firm way. Maybe there's something else and they want to come and pray or just use this time as your spirit moves in Christ's name. Amen. As the pianist plays. to somebody. Give them the greatest gift they could ever have, which is eternal life. tonight and uh, I hope we'll see most of you on Tuesday uh, for our five o'clock uh, service I know some have to work some have trouble getting here by that time but uh, if I do it later then I lose people to family activities so uh, it's kind of a no win so I like five o'clock and I hope you like five o'clock too and uh, pray I can find the candles upstairs <laughs> gotta do that okay and uh, you'll be back five o'clock we're done a little bit before 6. Great time. If for some reason you can't make it, uh, just have a blessed, wonderful Christmas with your family, uh, with people that you'll be with, and just uh, keep Christ in Christmas. Amen. Amen? Keep Him there. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this night. and Pray now that as we go, we go into our mission field. Lord, that you give us the the words to say, the opportunities to say it. We'll be prepared with a clean heart. We'll be ready with, with your word to show others the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to take the words that we've heard tonight to go out and to warn others that the end is coming. And Lord, it's the fact that if they die without Christ, one day this will be their end. Lord, tonight, just bless all that's done as we leave here. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed. If you didn't get a handout, see uh, Zachary or Natalie.